Welcome to part two on the phase retrieval workshop. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about molecular replacement. Um, like to uh, again remind you of the electron density equation. This is going to be an important part of the mathematical formulation of the molecular replacement method. Uh, the idea here, I'm going to stop sharing for just a minute. The idea here is that if you have a, a, a new crystal that you've collected diffraction of, from, represented here by the known answer, uh, let, let's say you've already found in the protein data bank, or maybe solved yourself, the structure of a highly related protein, but in a different crystal lattice. It, the question here is, can you use the information from the other structure to get some initial phases without having to redo a bunch of difficult experiments? And the answer is yes. The problem is one of finding the orientation of your previously known structure in the new unit cell. Um, uh, say, for instance, you've already solved the structure of mouse hemoglobin, and you want to solve the structure of human hemoglobin. If they crystallized in the same space group, you could just take the phases directly. But if they've crystallized in a different unit cell, in a different packing, you first have to learn the orientation of the previously known hemoglobin in this new crystal lattice. But once you position it properly, since we know mouse and human hemoglobins are very similar, it should be possible to get some fairly accurate initial phases. So qualitatively, that, that's what, what uh, molecular uh, replacement is. So let me uh, describe that a, a little more carefully again. Like before, the illustrations of these of this comes from Randy Reed's very fine course on on basic phasing. So imagine you have a, a structure with this this motif in this two dimensional form. Um, this may be the final the the final this this is may be the final answer. This is your structure to be solved, but of course you don't know that. At first, what do you know? Well, I showed you before in the previous video that you could calculate the Patterson map only knowing the amplitudes of the diffraction pattern. And when you do that for this structure, you get something like this. It's kind of a mess, um, but it definitely has uh, peaks corresponding to atoms in it. The problem is disentangling the Patterson map, which, as we said before, is the autocorrelation function of the electron density map. Um, so uh, the problem is rotating your known model into that structure. There's a, there are several uh, definitions of rotation systems. Here's the one for the equations that I'm going to show today, where you have a rotation kappa around some vector that's tipped down psi from the z-axis and rotated around the z-axis by some amount phi. So the definition of our target function for, the, for solving the rotation of um, the model into the new unknown structure is the, the product of the Patterson map for the unknown with the Patterson map for the model after you've rotated the model by these kappa phi and psi rotation angles. So as you should know, the autocorrelation function is large when, when, when these overlap, when they're both large or small, if, if they go up and down together, this function would be maximized. And so the goal is to uh, maximize this function of the, and determine the three angles. So that's the, the mathematical definition of finding the proper rotation. And I can illustrate this as follows. So suppose you're, you're the previously known structure has your motif, but it's in a different angle. What you're going to do 
is rotate this through all possible orientations and calculate how many vectors are explained for a given rotation. So here, here's, the, here's what the map looks like for the right answer. If I happen to rotate it in this position, which you may recall is the right rotation, then you will generate the, 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 these cyan Patterson peaks, which are shown here on the full map. And you can see they overlap actual uh, peaks in the experimental Patterson map for the unknown quite well. So when you get this in the proper rotation, you'll explain a large number of the Patterson peaks, okay, the ones shown in cyan, but not all of them because the molecule is only rotated properly. It's not translated properly yet. And so the peaks corresponding, the peaks of some of the, the some of them uh, don't, don't, uh, Aren't, aren't explained. So one divides this six dimensional rotation and translation problem into two parts. The, the three dimensional rotation part I just explained. There's also a way to optimize a function to find the optimum translation. So once you have the proper rotational solution, you move it around and you try to explain those additional peaks that we didn't talk about, that we didn't explain before. So there might be symmetry in the crystal. That's okay. You, you calculate that. You, you, you can try different rotations and, and get the answer there and then try to find, to solve the translation problem. So the translation problem is often written like this. Um, it, it compares um, the, um, the correlations uh, between observed and calculated structure factor amplitudes that are normalized in a, in a, in a certain way. And this, uh, the, the right answer gives rise, uh, the optimi optimization of this function gives rise to these red peaks. And again, if I show you the red peaks, they, they align, they're, they're almost on top of pe peaks in the actual map. So now you've solved the second part of the six dimensional problem and found that the translation of the object um, uh, of your model from your known structure in your new unknown unit cell. And if, if you've got the right answer, then you can get a reasonable um, R-free value. That is you can cross validate your result and see if the structure can be refined to to a, a, a satisfactory state. Uh, this method is very successful for many, many protein structures, uh, particularly when the model structure is very homologous. Obviously, the case I showed you, we already knew the exact distribution of atoms. Um, that it, it's, it sometimes comes into play in proteins if you're solving a mutant structure that's almost exactly the same in a different space group. But normally your, your model structure has to be very homologous to your unknown structure. Uh, typically, uh, it, when it's within about 25% sequence identity, um, and it doesn't have to be the whole protein that's within 25% identity. If you have a domain even, that's pretty homologous. Often you can bootstrap your way into finding that and then calculate a map and fill in the rest uh, later by uh, uh, gradually improving the quality of the faces in the density map. Uh, recently, there's been a fair amount of talk about going beyond just the use of homologs for models, but actually using uh, refined models from prediction methods such, such as AlphaFold2, which made a fairly famous increase in the quality of the models. And, and you can use AlphaFold2 to predict your protein and then use that as a starting model. And it looks like you, you're more likely to solve a molecular replacement problem with these kinds of models rather than the original homolog directly from the PDB. So, so that's pretty cool. So the number of structures solved by molecular replacement is increasing in the PDB because we have so many examples upon which to build 
uh, uh, models for uh, molecular replacement. So uh, when does it not work? When the structure has too many copies of the motif in the asymmetric unit of the crystal, or if the homolog is not accurate enough for you to identify the proper uh, solution uh, in the crystal. Uh, there are a variety of different algorithms. Uh, I only showed one example, but there are a variety of different algorithms to search and optimize potential solutions, some of which don't divide the problem into two three-dimensional problems, but go directly and try to solve the six-dimensional problem. There, some are done in real space, some are done in reciprocal space. Uh, the one commonly used in my lab and uh, maybe around the world is uh, from Randy Reed. It's called Phaser. It's uh, maximum likelihood based. It's very powerful. It's um, uh, easy, easy to use with a computer interface. Historically, there were uh, a number of other algorithms that were that were used. Uh, they're still out there. They may be the, the, the choice for certain cases. Or if the phaser doesn't work, you can you can try another algorithm. But like I said, increasingly molecular replacement is a is a is a in, loosely put a phase retrieval method that lets you uh, skip up experimental phase estimations and go um, directly to solve a new protein structure. So hope, hopefully uh, you got something from the introduction. If it was too basic for you, I apologize. But thanks for watching. Ciao.